Hey guys, so we're going to do something different today. Instead of the usual response videos I do, we're going to talk about some things that I promised to talk about. Too many times have I said something like, oh, I'll make a part 2 to this, or I'll talk about this in a future video. So now I just have a bunch of topics piled up and it's bothering me. Let's knock one of them out today. The main one I want to talk about is the further elaboration on C3, C4, and CAM plants and what they mean in terms of increased CO2 output. I know I have been a little slacking when it comes to this topic. Out of all the topics I talk about, I think I get the most enjoyment debunking people who deny the fact that the activities of humans are changing the climate. However, I'm not that good at doing this. I mean, I keep up with Potholder quite a bit. I watch as many of his videos as I can when he releases them, and I have to say, they're absolutely phenomenal. Shout out to Potholder for doing what he does. He debunks any claim better than the vast majority of skeptics on YouTube, I'd say. Whenever I release a video on climate change, I would always see people in the comment section going like, everyone, go watch Potholder. And when you're being compared to a god, well, there's no competition. So during the times when I make a video on climate change, I always think, fuck, should I respond to this section a little differently? What would Potholder say here? And then I delay the video and delay it further until the video comes out months later. <laughs> I know, this sounds very stupid, but I'm not that much of an expert on climate science anyway. My field is in biology, so let's talk a bit about biology. I think one of the most popular claims out there is regarding plants. CO2 is plant food, or CO2 increases plant mass, which is good for crops and whatnot. And this claim stems from only the most basic understanding of plant science. Just knowing that CO2 is an ingredient for photosynthesis does not mean more CO2 will increase the rate of plant growth. I talked about this in my previous videos, so I don't want to go into too much detail now. But basically, gases are exchanged through pores in the leaves of plants called stomata, but CO2 and oxygen aren't the only things that pass through these pores. Water does too, and plants lose a lot of water through transpiration, in which water leaves the stomata in the form of water vapor. This causes a negative pressure within the xylem of plants that can pull up more water from the soil, along with capillary action. Plants can control when to open up these pores, and when they open, you bet that everything is being exchanged. So while the plants are obtaining more CO2, they are also losing more water. It's a trade-off, and this has to be managed properly. Now, as carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, that makes it so more CO2 is diffused into the stomata per unit of time. That sounds good, right? No, because CO2 comes with the side effect of increasing temperatures, and as temperature increases, the rate of transpiration also increases, and this rate of water loss goes up faster than the rate of CO2 absorption for the vast majority of plants. As a result, they keep their stomata closed for longer periods of time. That means less CO2 absorption and less photosynthesis and less plant mass. And water isn't even the only limiting factor here. Nitrogen is also limited. So without an increase in water and nitrogen supply, increasing CO2 in temperatures will not help plant growth. And by extension to this argument, it's really annoying when people say, well, greenhouses increase CO2 for more plant growth. We've all heard that carbon dioxide, of course, is a pollutant. It drives climate. It is the single most important factor that determines what the climate's going to be uh, in the future and what the temperature is going to be and how much precipitation there's going to be, so much so that we have to put a danger sign on carbon dioxide. Um, but the question I really want to ask is, is it really a benefit, not just simply um, has it gotten a bad rap, but is it really something that we could do with a little bit more? Think of it as a building block. And indeed, if you think about uh, photosynthesis, we need carbon dioxide, we need water, we need energy, and we put together the sugars that essentially makes life and makes, makes life grow. In fact, greenhouses, professional greenhouses already knew this. And if you go to any high-end commercial greenhouse, you'll find one of these boxes or one by another company. But essentially, it enriches the carbon dioxide inside the greenhouse to two, three, or four times the natural concentration. Why is that? Because they already know what we already know, which is it causes plants to grow faster and improves plant quality. See, the thing is, greenhouses are heavily controlled. The environment is exactly what we want it to be. That means the plants get a proper supply of both water and nitrogen to keep up with the higher levels of CO2. Realistically, this can't be done for every single plant or every single crop we have on Earth, which is why you can't use greenhouses to say that carbon dioxide is good for plants. Now, Rod Martin Jr., someone who if I responded to in the past, made an additional response to me a while ago in his blog. I won't be going over the whole thing now, and maybe I will in the future, but in the article he wrote, CO2 is at starvation levels, dangerously close to mass extinction levels. When CO2 levels fell down to 800 parts per million, plants worldwide freaked out enough to evolve C4 species to cope with the CO2 starvation. It must be pointed out that different species don't automatically decide to change their internal DNA in a common direction without some common external force. Okay, so this claim is simply wrong and misinformed. C4 plants did not evolve due to low CO2 levels. They evolved because of the changing environment over 30 million years ago. Plants migrated to more open environments where sunlight was 
was more potent. In this condition, C4 plants have a distinct advantage over C3. Areas that receive more direct sunlight increases the rate of transpiration. Therefore, C4, being able to capture the same amount of CO2 with less of a water tax, were able to keep their stomata open for longer and thus more photosynthesis. The evolution didn't have anything to do with low CO2 levels. It was due to sunlight and transpiration rates. Plus, today's levels are just over 400 ppm, which is half of 800. And yet, C3 plants are doing perfectly fine, composing of more than 90% of all plants in the world. Your claim is just simply wrong. I'll leave a source in the description of the video for that claim. Hopefully I remember. And this brings us to C4, and by extension, cam plants. Warning, this next part is extremely educational. If you're not ready for a biology lesson, feel free to close this video now. I'm here to further debunk the claim that more CO2 equals more photosynthesis, but this is going to get a little bit more detailed. Alright, you guys are gone? Cool. Hello to the one viewer who is willing to sit through this. Let's learn about plants. C3 plants are the plants that you mostly see. Well, everywhere. Point at any plant and you have a 95% chance of it being C3. But in certain hotter and drier areas, or areas with more sunlight, you'll see C4 plants. So how exactly are these plants able to absorb the same amount of CO2 while losing around a quarter of the water molecules that C3 plants pay? How do they have an advantage in higher temperatures? The secret lies within its biochemistry. I've talked about this briefly a long time ago while debunking David Reeves, but we're going to go into more detail now. See, C3 plants have a biochemical cycle called the Calvin cycle. You guys have probably heard this many times in your high school biology classes, but to debunk the claim that CO2 is good for plants, let's talk about it in more detail. See, once carbon dioxide enters the leaf, it needs to be captured. This process is called carbon fixation, which is one of the steps in the Calvin cycle. In C3 plants, this is done through an enzyme called Rubisco, which attaches a carbon dioxide molecule to RUBP, forming two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. I won't go through the rest of the cycle since that's not important here, but the 3-phosphoglycerate can then go on to build glucose to increase plant mass. Now, when CO2 levels rise, so do temperatures. And when temperature rises, that poses a problem to C3 plants, specifically Rubisco. Rubisco doesn't only attach a carbon dioxide molecule to RUBP, it also has oxygen gas as a substrate, which means it can react to both. If it binds to oxygen, then phosphoglycolate is formed along with the existing 3-phosphoglycerate. And this phosphoglycolate molecule is sent to the mitochondria for photorespiration. Photorespiration is wasteful, especially at high rates. The plant would rather undergo sugar production. Essentially, it's there for a purpose of recycling RUBP back so that it could potentially be used for photosynthesis instead. Rubisco has about a 3-4 to four times more affinity towards carbon dioxide than oxygen, so photorespiration isn't performed too often. However, that's under normal conditions. See, Rubisco is sensitive. It reacts to the levels of CO2 and oxygen, and also temperature. Of course, higher levels of CO2 and lower O2 will increase the rate of CO2 binding to Rubisco. However, like I mentioned many times, increased CO2 by human activity also increases temperature, due to carbon dioxide being a greenhouse gas, and this causes the stomata to be open for less periods of time due to the increased transpiration rates. The stomata being closed for longer means less CO2 are in the leaves, while O2 continues to build up, which will ultimately increase photorespiration rates and lower photosynthesis activity. Second, when the temperature increases, that also directly affects Rubisco. The enzyme normally has a biochemical mechanism to increase its affinity for carbon dioxide instead of oxygen, but higher temperatures can alter its physical component and destabilize the intermediate structure before the formation of 3-phosphoglycerate, which is called, get this, 3-keto-2-carboxyarabic binidol 1,5-bisphosphate. Therefore, higher temperatures mean oxygen binds better to rubisco, which triggers higher rates of photorespiration and lower rates of photosynthesis. As a result, even if CO2 levels are high due to human activity, the change in rubisco's affinity towards carbon dioxide and oxygen will actually lower plant growth. This is in addition to the water tax that plants would already have to pay. Got everything so far? Yeah, I know it's confusing, but please bear with me. So, how do C4 plants avoid that particular mechanism? How are they able to reduce the amount of photorespiration occurring? They do this by taking advantage of Rubisco's sensitivity to carbon dioxide concentrations. The carbon fixation molecule here is no longer Rubisco, but rather it's PEP carboxylase. In simple terms, it has a much higher affinity to CO2 than Rubisco, so it is able to steal it. It then converts it to oxaloacetate, which forms malate. The malate is then transported to Rubisco resides, namely the vascular bundles, and releases the CO2. By concentrating Concentrating carbon dioxide around Rubisco, C4 plants can take advantage of Rubisco's preference for higher CO2 levels to minimize photorespiration. Therefore, it can survive in higher temperatures because it has the ability to open its stomata for shorter periods of time. This is at the cost of higher ATP usage, but it's well worth it. CAM plants are somewhat similar in its ability to survive higher temperatures in drier environments, but the mechanisms are somewhat different. Although C4 and CAM plants exist in the world, that doesn't mean increased CO2 doesn't pose a problem. C3 fixation still makes up the vast majority of plants around the world, around 95% these are the plants we need to think about when we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Simply saying CO2 is plant food isn't good enough. You need to consider the biochemistry of what actually happens within the plant. Anyway, that's the end of this video. I hope you learned something new. And if someone claims that humans releasing CO2 is good for plants, you are now well equipped with the knowledge to debunk their nonsense. Cool.
Thank you to Fireshard, Daniel Seibel, and Shere Khan for being the top patrons once again. See you next week. <laughs>